Good morning. My name is Marion Zuflay and I work for the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. Today I'm going to talk to you about insect pests or potential insect pests of hemp and their management. This was my first summer working in hemp and I've really enjoyed the experience. So my goal this summer was to just go out there and learn as much as I can about hemp, try to identify any insects and diseases that are out there. So today I'm going to specifically just talk about the insect pests. We've already heard about some of the diseases out there. And so I'm just going to focus in on what insects I found. Before I get started, I first just wanted to stress the importance of scouting and identification because not everything that's out there is a pest. In fact, very few insects to date have caused enough damage to impact hemp. And this crop is still relatively new, so we don't have a lot of thresholds for any insect pests that we do find. So for this reason, it's very important for you to go out, scout your hemp fields regularly, and that way you can notice any potential problems and keep an eye on them. So what I did this summer was I scouted nine different hemp fields weekly, as well as one high tunnel. And I also set up uh, European corn borer tracks, which you can see here in the picture, next to hemp fields so I can monitor the flight of European corn borer, which is one of the known pests, potential pests of hemp. Again, not everything is a pest, so we have to be able to identify what's a pest, what's a beneficial, and what's an incidental, an insect that just happens to be out in the field but isn't causing any damage. Okay, so now I'm going to go over some of the insects that I did find this season. The first one that I encountered was early in the season while the plants were still in the greenhouse. The grower came to me and he informed me that hundreds of his seedlings were dying. And you can see that from the top um, upper right hand corner. The seedlings were turning yellow and were dying and he wasn't quite sure what was causing it. And we noticed that he had a lot of fungus gnats and he also had fusarium. And we determined that it was fusarium. We took some seedlings and sent them to Chris Smart and she identified fusarium in the seedlings. So the fungus gnats, they are tiny little flies that lay their eggs in wet soil near the base of the plants. The larvae will hatch out of the eggs and then they start feeding on decaying matter, but they will also feed on roots. And both the adult fungus gnats as well as the larvae can transmit diseases such as fusarium. So what the grower did is he changed out his potting media and then he also decreased his watering. He was overwatering his plants and you're supposed to really let them dry out between waterings, let the top layer dry out between waterings. Um, and that really helped his um, fungus net problem. And he also introduced nematodes. So one thing you can do to monitor for fungus gnats is you can place yellow sticky cards in your greenhouse so that you can detect them early. Um, if you do have fungus gnats, you should allow the top layer of soil to dry out completely. This will kill both the fungus as well as, which the gnats feed on, as well as the fungus gnat larvae. So really let that soil dry out between waterings. This is the two-spotted spider mite. These are small little mites found on the underside of leaves and they cause this stippling appearance that you can see in both of the pictures, kind of on the upper surface of the leaves. You usually notice the stippling first and then if you turn the leaf over, you'll find the spider mites. These I found in the high tunnel as well as in the field. And both, of the num both in the high tunnel as well as in the field, the numbers stayed fairly low. The high tunnel has since been harvested and no control measures were needed and the populations in the field have never increased. I monitor it weekly and the numbers have stayed very, very low. Two spotted spider mites do prefer very hot, dry weather. So one of the ways to manage for them is to make sure that your plants aren't water stressed. You can also remove any potential weed hosts that are surrounding your field. And then if you do have a spider mite problem or you know that you will, um, you can release predatory mites to control the spider mite population. But if you do do this, you have to do it in advance of the spider mites becoming out of control. So as soon as you have that first sign of two spotted spider mites, you want to release your beneficial predatory mites. This is the red-headed flea beetle, which was probably the most numerous insect that I observed this summer. The adults are fairly large, three to six millimeters, and have a reddish brown head and a shiny black body. They feed on the leaves between the, between the veins and cause these holes all over the leaves. Even though they were very numerous and I saw quite a bit of damage, all the plants grew out of it. And the young seedlings are the ones that are most at risk from flea beetle damage. So some of the control measures you can do is you can protect your young seedlings with row cover until they're large enough to withstand the feeding pressure. Uh, you can also plow in the, to decrease the overwintering population. And then you can use beneficial nematodes, which will control the larvae in the soil. I also found some aphids. These are small sap-sucking insects, kind of pear-shaped. 
They're found on the underside of the leaves, but they can also be found near the stem or in the flowers. There are several different species of aphids that are known to occur on hemp. Of the nine fields that I was scouting, only one of them did I find aphids in, and um, they remained on the lower leaves. And there was a lot of beneficials, including ladybugs and minute pirate bugs and lacewings that really kept the population under control. They are still out there, and I'm still monitoring them weekly to make sure that the population doesn't get any bigger. I did take a sample, and I sent it to the Cornell Insect Diagnostic Lab for identification because I don't know what species it is. Um, but I only found the one in one field. There are a few different insects that will bore into the stem of hemp, including the common stock borer, which is pictured here, as well as European corn borer and the hemp borer. The only one that I found this season was the common stock borer. I've not found the other ones. I did set up traps for European corn borer, but the numbers were very, very low, and I never found any in the plant. So here's a picture of a larvae inside a hemp stalk. They are brown with these long white lines that run the length of the body. The female will lay her eggs in grasses and weeds kind of around the edge of a field and when they hatch, the, when the larvae hatch, they will move into the field looking for a suitable plant to bore into. So one of the management options is to control your weeds and grasses in the surrounding fields. Usually if you do have stalk borer, it's going to be on the edge of fields where you're going to find the damage. Another option is to plant your plants early so that they're large enough that when the larvae move in, they can withstand some of that boring damage. Chemical control options are limited because once they're inside the stem, they're protected from any kind of chemical control. This is the last insect that I'm going to talk about, the yellow woolly bear caterpillar. This is a caterpillar that feeds on many different plants, including hemp. It's covered in dense yellow hairs over its entire body. And this one I found in the high tunnel that I was scouting. And usually it doesn't cause a problem. The female lays about 50 eggs on a host plant and the caterpillars, they feed together for a little while, but then they disperse throughout the field and just cause a little bit of damage to individual plants. Um, but because this was in a high tunnel, they were all concentrated in one area and they couldn't disperse. It caused much more significant damage. So when I was in there scouting, I noticed a lot of the plants, the lower third of the plant was completely defoliated. So I notified the grower about that, and what we ended up doing, he just went in and handpicked them all. And there's probably about 100 or so in the high tunnel, but he could control them. Since it wasn't a defined area, he could just go in and handpick them all to remove them. And it didn't really cause any serious damage because we were able to get rid of them. So here, just real briefly, is a list of some of the other insects that I found on hemp, which includes the leaf miner, which I'm attempting to rear out to determine what kind of what species it is, four-lined plant bug, various caterpillars, different grasshoppers, brown marmorated stink bug, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, um, the oblique banded leaf roller, I was able to rear that out, um, and the tarnished plant bug. So as you can see, there's a lot of different insects that are found on hemp. Not all of them are pests, so it's important to know what's a pest, what's just what's an incidental, and of course, as I mentioned before, what are your beneficials so that you can just control the ones that you need to. So if there's any questions, I will take those now.